You're looking at live pictures on the ground in Beijing, where leaders are gathering for the country's most important political events of the year. Will policymakers send a clear pro-growth message to pull the economy out of its doldrums? The CPPCC preparing to convene in a few hours ahead of tomorrow's main event, the National People's Congress. And we are half an hour from the market opens in Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Shenzhen. Welcome to the very first edition of the China Show on Bloomberg Television. I'm David Ingles with Yvonne Matt. Our top stories this morning, Japan leading Asian stocks higher to start the week as investors watch for any signal from the MPC about further policy support for China's struggling recovery. Beijing's top leaders already pledging to meet their economic goals without adding financial risk. Now we await details on that target and the strategy for getting there. And I'm Stephen Engel here in Beijing, a very chilly Beijing, where lawmakers are preparing to confront the many headwinds hindering growth, uh, from the property crisis to consumer confidence, weak demand, and deflation. We made it here. Welcome, Dave. It's very excited to be launching this show with you today. Here we go. Second time around for us two here since 2019 when we first opened the China Open. Yeah. And we've got a new name though now. Yeah. So we're so this is the China Show. Welcome, by the way, to the premiere of the program. And hope you're all wet and had a good weekend. And certainly, it's the timing to be having longer, deeper, more in-depth, more nuanced conversations around China, the Chinese economy, the political structure, what it means for the political economy, what it means for the world. Uh, the timing could not be better than where we are currently with this market, where we are with this economy, and what this really means for the program and for the rest of the world. So, yeah, it's... Uh I'm excited. Yeah, we're preparing for this for, for weeks and months now, and certainly we have a big lineup oh. of newsmakers, of guests to really talk through those structural challenges, as you mentioned. And really, is this a, a material moment for markets here as we count down to that work report from the premier? Uh, we got Li Daohui, David Lee from Tsinghua University, a prominent economist in China, to talk us through those themes. We have also Ronald Temple from Lazard Asset Management, uh, also Robin Shane. We got a big data dump as well, of course, uh, trade numbers and the like here to wrap up the week as well. And and Desiree Wang, J.P. Morgan Asset Management China CEO on International Women's Day. There we go. A bit of a tease of what's coming up. So that's a busy week ahead. It's a busy day today as far as the agenda in China is concerned here. So it is a big week. The two sessions begin today. You have the CPPCC, of course, convening. 12 noon local time today. We have the press briefing on the National People's Congress, which, by the way, begins tomorrow. And, of course, the highlight and central uh, to the conversation on Tuesday will be that work report. These are the key targets, how they get their key priorities, of course, as it pertains. Yvonne was talking about all the data coming through this week. Trade numbers coming through. We have a glance at PMI on the services front. And as we make our way into Thursday and Friday, we have the fi financial secretary, there we go, Paul Chan, speaking here as we look ahead to that. There's a lot that's going on after yeah. that budget that came out, right? Mm. Home sales this weekend, just surging when it comes to transaction volumes alike. Here we'll talk a little bit more about what we saw with that Henderson land project in just a couple minutes time. Let's get to our chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel, joining us now on the ground in Beijing as we count down, of course, to MPC. And Steve, how's it feeling like? I know it's cold, but what's really on tap here this week? <laughs> I'm not feeling much right now, to be perfectly honest. Yes, it's cold. We've been here pre-dawn, and uh, it's, um, you know what, but the, the mood is pretty positive, actually. Uh, you know, there's a security cordon and blanket uh, like no other, obviously, around the two sessions, the Liao Hui, the two meetings, of course, the National People's Congress and the CPPCC, the advisory body, which gets underway today uh, ahead of the NPC. The security cordon, yes, uh, very tight, but very friendly. We had an officer come over and talk to us. I guess I was interrogated for about 15 minutes or so, but he was super nice, very warm and fuzzy and friendly. And so that was, uh, you know, a nice uh, scene setter for us as we start off this coverage, of course, which will likely run until about March 11th. We don't have the final date when it all wraps up just yet. We'll probably know that later today. Uh, but again, it, it usually lasts between one to two weeks. And uh, we're going to be all over it here in Beijing. And of course, the key 
meet tomorrow is Lee Chung will have his work report, and that's going to kind of outline the economic priorities uh, to the provinces and around the country. And again, we've talked to people here, we've talked to people here, and essentially they're saying we're just looking for the leadership signs of hope because of the struggling economy. Early spring's cross currents in Beijing can be tough to read, as China faces a host of economic headwinds ahead of the annual session of parliament, the National People's Congress. With property market turmoil, poor consumer confidence, persistent deflation, destabilized geopolitical ties, along with plummeting FDI, and a rocky stock market, simply put, it's not been a good first year for President Xi Jinping since taking a precedence busting third consecutive term last March. The economy is still tough, slowly recovering, but I think mean, the confidence has not come back. So far, state-directed funds have mobilized to stabilize wobbly markets, while Beijing replaced the head of the securities regulator and cracked down on so-called malicious short selling. Banks, too, eased a loan prime rate tied to mortgages, and consumers came back and spent mightily. During the week-long Lunar New Year holiday, the best set of spring festival numbers since pre-COVID. But was it all enough to turn the winter bears into spring bulls? 2023 has been an unfortunate confluence in China of deflation and de-risking. Um, I think this year the policymakers want to go back into reflation and hopefully reform. In terms of the ability of these measures to really change the market sentiment, we are slightly more cautious. Uh, because what's really needed is a change in the uh, inflation outlook for the country and the overall sentiment in the private sector. You've got sentiment which is rock bottom uh, and at the same time I think the issue is of policy credibility in the market. The growth engine remains one where it's more let's say government-led, infrastructure-led, manufacturing and investment-led uh, and, and those might help to get to the growth target uh, but in terms of the more dynamism and, and the more sustainable type of growth, uh, we think it's, it still needs some work. So attention now turns to Premier Li Chang's work report on day one of the NPC. Post-holiday, Li called for, quote, pragmatic and forceful action to boost confidence. But how? So far, there's been no big bang policy move as leaders stress de-risking and deleveraging with fiscal strain in property and at local governments. Instead of looking for more candies from the government, we really want to say, can we actually go back to more like what China started in its reform back in the early 1980s? It's more, you know, allow the private uh, enterprises, entrepreneurs to the right incentive to, to really to do things, the freedom. Wishful thinking, perhaps, for global investors who got burned by multiple stresses on China's private sector, including COVID zero and a regulatory takedown of big tech. We've been out of China for a long time. We um, essentially started getting nervous about China when Jack Ma was hauled in. So that was in 2020, very long time ago. And uh, for the past year and a half or two, we've had no exposure in China, none whatsoever. The world is watching Beijing's next policy move, perhaps at the NPC, with great interest. I think the key word is confidence. What kind of messaging will come out of the NPC and the CPPCC about uh, restoring and boosting confidence at a time when obviously the property sector is in trouble and the private sector uh, has been really hit hard because of COVID zero policies and of course, again, just sort of a uh, re-emphasis on state-owned enterprises. So whatever messaging they can do to boost confidence will be uh, closely watched. Right. And Steve, apart from the actual growth target and some of the, I guess, related factors that find and orient themselves towards the growth target, what else do you think we should be paying attention to this week? Yeah, again, it's, it's just about what are going to be the marching orders to the provinces uh, that have been fiscally absolutely battered through COVID-0. They had to foot the bill for all the testing and the quarantine and everything else. And on top of that, the property sector has been battered so badly that property land sales, which are used to refill the coffers at the, uh, at the provincial level, uh, you know, have been decimated. And, and again, 
where are they going to get their revenue? So that's why we've not necessarily seen, you know, big bang bazooka. We've seen piecemeal approach to trying to restore confidence and put a floor on this sinking economy. Uh, but again, many market participants and, and the world, if you will, are watching for more forceful conviction from policymakers. Uh, but again, I don't think we're going to go back to the old playbook of uh, heavy fiscal stimulus, shovel-ready projects uh, nationwide, as, uh, of course, Xi Jinping has been emphasizing high-quality development that is sustainable. Steve, we'll come to you soon. Stephen Engel there, our chief of Asia correspondent, definitely bundled up. Hmm. We'll see you soon. Great look at the market action here, of course. Uh, we're taking a look at when it comes to a big week when it comes to markets, not just when it comes to NBC, right? We got Jay Powell's testimony coming up. Global stocks have clocked in 16 weekly gains in the last 18, David. U.S. is definitely part of that, right? I think we reached a 15th record on the S&P just last week. Yeah, I stopped counting after it. <laughs> stopped, I stopped counting out of 10. That's taking global equity markets, as you can see, record high right now. Taiwan just opening up 1.3%. We hit that 40,000 level about 30, 40 minutes back on the Nikkei 225, flipped the boards and really getting us geared up uh, to the open today. Golden Dragon Index on Friday, 1% gain. So maybe some tailwinds as we look at futures coming online over in Singapore. Yeah, we talk about the, the, the month that we have when it comes to Chinese equities. It looks like we are continuing on this momentum and usually equities tend to do quite well after MPC as well. You take a look at how A50 futures are shaping up right now. We're down about a fifth of 1%. Uh, dollar China's at 721 or so. And we're talking about Chinese 10 year yield at 236. So you continue to see this CGB rally on this Monday morning. Yep, let's see if we take out that record low. The RMB fix is out in about three minutes from now. And just ahead here on the China Show, BNP Parba, Deputy China CEO George Sun joins us in a couple of minutes. We'll dig, dig deeper into what's, well, essentially to expect, what to hope for. Maybe two separate questions there as Chinese lawmakers gather in Beijing. And later on in the program, a deeper dive into Chinese equity markets. A roundtable coming up with Goldman Sachs and Bofa Securities. Kinder Lau joins us with Winnie Wu as well. They have opposing views on a lot of sectors here. We'll dig deeper into that. Counting down to the open of trade, first one of the week, Shanghai, Shenzhen. And here, in a fairly foggy, cool, not gloomy Hong Kong, this is The China Show. Good morning. So we're just over 15 minutes away from the opening bell. Futures are pointing lower. Live pictures of the Forbidden City in Beijing. All roads lead to the capital this week. The who's who, the powers that be. Markets are looking at this for any clues and where we go as far as policy targets, initiatives, and the way we get there uh, is concerns. And we talked about this as well. We've asked our clients what they think, what to expect out of these two sessions. Yeah, you know, obviously the single most important sort of indicator is going to be that growth target here right now. And you ask what the consensus is. It seems like things might just stay the same, right, if it's 5%. But that doesn't mean that, you know, 5% this year versus 5% last year, that target means very different things. Oh, yeah. Because of the low base effects and the like. That, you know, how they, what sort of policy is going to be needed to deliver that 5% is what will keep the market going in terms of uh, initial catalyst and the like. So if futures are looking like this. So above 5.5%, there's zero responses. Around 5%, that's really is where the majority lies here right now. That budget deficit as well, very much in focus. Is it really going to be just the 3%, which is, of course, always has been that target? Mm. Or could it be slightly above that? Yeah, and what will be the supplementary budget, special lending, and all those things? And how much bonds do they need to issue to exactly. well, plug this sort of fiscal gap that they need to put in place for all that spending? We'll get all those details soon. Joining us here in set... Our guest this hour, George Sun, BNP Paribas, Deputy CEO of China and Head of Global Markets for Greater China. Nice to see you, sir. Thank you, David. Welcome. Uh, oh, thank you for having me on the show. <laughs> no, no, well, welcome to this welcome. new show. This is, you know, we're all, we're all, we're all, we're all, we're all welcome to yeah, this Yeah, it's first day at school for all of us here. <laughs> uh, two related questions. The NPCs this week, two yeah. sessions, let's put it that way. What should I expect and what can I hope for? Maybe two separate things. Okay. Well, I think we got a little bit of a preview of what to expect uh, last Thursday when the Pala Bureau met, actually, uh, led by uh, President mm -hmm. Xi himself. Um, they kind of worked on the uh, government work plan, actually, which, uh, which Premier Li will announce tomorrow at the beginning of the uh, MPC. So uh, there'll be many, many topics, but one will be the, uh, one will be the growth uh, plan target for the year. So the question is whether
rather it's going to be around 5% or something a bit more firm. If they actually say something a bit more firm, like really we're going to get to 5% no matter what, then you would expect a lot more stimulus than last year because it was such a low base effect last year, right? If they are a little bit more flexible or they even go lower and say 4.5%, then you know that they're going to focus on things more like national security and stability rather than economic growth. So it's really... It's really uh, a bit of a, a choice between are, you, are they going to focus more on uh, economic growth or more on the national security and stability again? Some say, you know, a, a lot of the policy tone has basically been, been predetermined if you look at you know, the work conference that we saw late last year in December. Yeah. What could be a positive sort of surprise we could get this week? Well, people talk about the, uh, the stimulus and uh, why, why do they need more fiscal stimulus? I think a lot of it still has to do with the housing market because a lot of the housing market issues sit with the local governments, actually. Um, so you're going to need, so besides this uh, fiscal, uh, this fiscal deficit, which we think will be closer to 3.5% of GDP as opposed to 3% this year, so they'll probably dial it up a little bit. Um, but besides that, there's going to be a lot of special uh, local government bonds that are going to have to be issued. Last year, they issued about 3.9 trillion renminbi, and then they also issued a billion of a, a trillion, sorry, a trillion of central uh, special bonds. So they issue all that 4.9 trillion of bonds. The fiscal deficit goes up to 7.4 percent, not three, not three and a half percent actually. So if they do that, that will firm up a lot of the projects around the country that need to be finished. I think that's one of the biggest problems. You have a lot of these unfinished projects, uh, property projects with developers that have either you know, uh, defaulted or, or otherwise are short of cash. All these unfinished projects, they don't do anybody any good, and they don't, they don't generate any cash flow, and it creates a lot of bad will of people who've already uh, uh, paid the mortgages. So basically, there's uh, 50 developers on the, on the white list now and over 3,000 projects that have been approved for financing, and these kind of special local government bonds are going to help finance some of these. So they get done. The buildings get done, uh, the properties get, de uh, get, get delivered to people who've paid for them, and, I, I, and it, there are talks that they're going to start going towards a bit of a Singapore model, where hmm. you're starting to see in some places where the projects get done, there's not enough demand, so the government buys it up and rents it out at a, a reasonable level for, uh, the, uh, for the public, actually. So you could get a situation where some of the housing gets absorbed that way by the SOEs and by the local government right. to provide a kind of more affordable housing for the masses, which is part of President Xi's. Uh, uh, plan anyway, and then you may have another tier where the pricing is more flexible on the upper end. Right. I mean, the comparison to Singapore is it's good and bad. I mean, Singapore is way advanced as far as the development cycle is concerned, right? So in, a, in one way, that brings up the question, the structural forces at work in this property market, right? There's fewer births. Yeah. Uh, no, one's, no one's getting married. I'm yeah. exaggerating as yeah. well, right? So, so who, who will be... Okay, let's say they finish the apartments and everything. Who are the willing buyers? Yeah, yeah good, good question. So there are usually three types of buyers, right? Um, what you just said. People get married uh, uh, by property. People who have more children uh, have property. And people who move to the cities, move from the countryside to the cities, this whole urbanization, which was talked a lot about previous years. Hmm. But all three forces have come down. Um, the, you know, marriage rate, I was looking at this. It's, uh, it's half of what it was 10 years ago. Do they still publish that first? Uh, they, they publish that. They don't publish the first marriage. They have the overall marriage statistics. Okay. Uh, so you can see that. It's about half of what it was 10 years ago. The birth rate is, was like 9 million last year. Uh, from, 2000 to two, uh, from 2000 to 2020, it was more like 16 million. So it's dropped a lot. Uh, but I think the urbanization is important. If that continues, actually, that could actually bring the people who move from the countryside to the cities. If jobs are created in the cities, people move to the cities, they need to buy a house. Hmm. Uh, that number has decreased. It used to be about 20 2 million a year that move from the countryside to the cities. Uh, last couple of years it was more like 12. So that's 10 million uh, people gap. If that actually picks up, if enough private sector um, companies are uh, supported so that the um, the POEs actually feel incentivized to start hiring again and attract people from the countryside into mm. the cities. That could fill a lot of the gap for the, uh, pro for the property shortfall. Mm. Interesting, as you say, right? The, the, the three things that you know, Chinese people invested in was property, stocks, and children. Yeah. All three of those, you say, deliver some poor returns. Yeah, it's kind of <laughs> difficult to think of children as returns, but it's uh, it's true. They can't so, find a job when they graduate. That, right? That's yeah. the issue, actually. So uh, if you know, even uh, talking uh, uh, kind of onshore in China, there's a lot of pressure actually because it's not just at the university level. Only about in many cities, only about half of the uh, middle school students are allowed to progress to uh, to high school actually through their exams, and then those progress to university. But if the uh, if there aren't enough uh, good jobs being created, uh, that becomes a real strain on the economy and people 
people then don't buy houses, get married, have children, mm -hmm. that whole cycle, right? But uh, when we look at it, uh, uh, SOEs certainly are important, but uh, POEs, private enterprises, historically they've produced 80% of the urban jobs and driven 60% of the GDP. So at this NPC coming up tomorrow, if there's a bit more stress on kind of uh, also supporting the private sector uh, to create more jobs, I think that would be very uh, strong indication. The bright spots obviously we talk about, right? Whether it's EVs, it's high-end manufacturing, it's, it's advanced chips. Mm. What, at what point do those elements of the economy can offset and actually be big growth drivers mm. for the economy? It offsets a bit, but we have to be a little bit careful there as well because there could be over-direction of resources to those sectors as well. If you look at EVs, for example, right now um, uh, it's been a bright spot. Uh, the technology is amazing, uh, but there's probably enough capacity for EVs in China to satisfy twice as much demand as actual demand in China. So now they're looking to uh, export some of these EVs mm. in order to be able to uh, 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 you know, fulfill all these capacities. The good news is they're actually, even though it's still quite tough between uh, China and the U.S., you're seeing Europe yeah. stepping up. George, so, yep. Well, I got to step in. Uh, we'll continue the conversation, of course. Sure. Sam will be staying with us here at BNP Power, but not only run to bank, as you can see, maybe <laughs> to be a matchmaker as well. He's sticking around here for conversations. Breaking news coming through. Adani Group marketing their dollar bonds. First one, I believe, in about its 18-year dollar bonds. Initial pricing coming up. More details on this to follow. Counting down to the open of trade. We're called higher on Hong Kong markets. Ahead of the open, seven minutes away. Plenty more ahead. This is The China Show. All right. It seems that we're headed in two separate directions here. We're looking at markets here in Hong Kong headed higher ahead of the open. As you can see, pricing is in green there. And certainly when you look at A50 futures, uh, which tend to reflect onshore equity markets, we're looking at lower there. A little bit of strength coming through and I'm being generous there as far as the Chinese currency is concerned. Yeah, we're taking a look at some analyst actions here today as well, most of which are earnings related, the likes of Hong Kong Exchange and the like. So right now, China Coal A shares, that's rated new buy at Guosan. Budweiser APAC raised to buy at ICBC Research. And Hong Kong Exchange cut to a hold at DBS Bank. Yep. In terms of stocks to watch, Hong Kong developers oh, were watching that very closely. There was one Henderson Land project, according to SCMP. That was pretty wild. Sold out within hours. Of course, this is one of the first projects that came out post-budget and, of course, the cooling of all property curbs here in the city. Hong Kong Exchange Economic Journal also talking about those 10 major estates weekend sales reaching that one-year high. You're seeing developers up this morning. Quite a bit what policy, at least clarity in policy can do, doesn't yeah. it? As you can tell, Midland there, which went absolutely through the ceiling last week, up 6% in the pre-market. EVs in play. Vehicle numbers coming out. Lee Auto, though, fading a bit that rally from last week post-earnings. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. You're watching The China Show. We are coming down to the open of markets. Call it the eve of NPC, right? We have the CPPCC that's convening in just a few short hours. But certainly, everything we're looking for clues on where the policy direction. Is this really going to signal the pivot that investors have been yearning for for months, if not years now, David? And really, are we likely to see more momentum behind this equity market continue? Yeah, a lot will depend on what happens this time tomorrow with the work report, of course, the targets coming out, how they get their policy intention, as we were uh, pointing out as well. Well, certainly there's been a there's been a change really in tone. Central Economic Work Conference in December and the weeks that followed, of course, when markets continued to crash in China, and then there was the turn, right? You had a lot of support measures coming through in this market. Hence, the, when you look at these levels coming through as well, why we're up what 12 to 15 percent from the lows we hit back uh, in late January. Do we get do we have enough momentum for them to step back as far as stabilization measures are concerned? And what does a three to six month window look like? CSI 300 flat at the open, MSCI China continues continuing uh, to see some gains, as you can see on your screens. We're looking very closely, as you can see, your China 10-year yield right now at 2.36. You're also looking at 2.5% on your 30-year. If you've left your money in that, by the way, you, you would have made a lot of money without all the drama. Flip the boards, please, and have a look across sector groups within this Chinese equity market and why you do that. Small caps, by the way. Here we go. CSI 300 financials, consumer staples, which brings to mind, right, a lot of conversations we've had recently. Where do you put your money? Given that we are 12 to 15 percent up, high dividend yields, yielders, right? 
where you are with cash. SOEs, that's a bit more nuanced uh, there as well. Uh, CSI 300 consumer staples, casino stocks are seeing some pressure right now. We're looking at developers, not Chinese mainly in particular, a lot of the Hong Kong plays. Uh, fantastic week last week for a lot of the real estate brokers here in Hong Kong. We'll talk more about that story uh, in just a moment. In fact, just on the very note here, some of these developers coming through here in Hong Kong, flip the page please if we can. Hong Kong developers, there we go. Gains across uh, the board right now. Henderson Land, 2.7%, some news coming through there. The stock still flying, Midland Holdings up something like 90% or more uh, last week, up 5.6% out of the gates. And I'll leave you with a look at EVs, uh, with some vehicle numbers coming through as well. Year and year down, some softness coming through. But, you know, we're, we're still not too distant from that, that Lee Auto set of numbers a few, about a week back, week and a half back, that really just turned a page on that. We're down, though, as you can see. Wow. Wow. 10%. What's that about? Anyway, we'll dig deeper into that. But as you can see, substantial, uh, substantial losses there at the open, Yvonne. Yeah, just reaching those double digits and reversing some of the mm. gains that we saw last week. Um, some five things to watch, right? So we have our eyes on just, you know, the clear signs of whether we do see some sort of fiscal push and the like, right? Whether we get that or not. What to watch in terms of deflation pressure? Are they going to maintain that CPI target at 3%? And if that's the case, is that just a ceiling? Or are they looking at to price pressures to really come back? Saw market rescue, any more signs of that? Of course, with this, with this property downturn, I think more support for the struggling property market is certainly one that's coming key for investors. Population decline, obviously youth unemployment. Those are all the themes, of course, we've been talking about uh, on this show. We're back with George Sun, Deputy China CEO and Head of Global Markets for Greater China at BNP Paribas. Is this going to be a make or break sort of week for markets, you think? Or is this MPC largely irrelevant? No, it's very relevant, but I think it's going to continue what we saw in February, I think. I think we saw a turning point at the end of January. When January, when the equity market took another big tumble after three years of declines already, I think a decision was probably made at the senior level that enough is enough. So they kind of pulled out the playbooks from 2015, 2016 and said, let's put a bottom on this, change the CSRC chairman, mm. uh, put some limits on uh, fund outflows, on short selling, on quant funds, all this stuff, put limits in. Now, that may reduce liquidity and market volume in the short term, but it buys time. It puts a stable bottom in to say, look, we're going to put a very clear message out in the market that we're going to support the, uh, uh, support the markets and uh, we're going to give it time to recover. Something like 60 billion U.S. dollar equivalent have been pumped in to the onshore uh, A shares, mostly through the CSI 300 or 500 ETFs and uh, products uh, supporting that. So I think all this sends a message to the market that, look, uh, you know, we're determined this time to, uh, to put a bottom and to get this uh, U-shaped recovery back on track. Right. Right. Well, dare I ask this next question, which seems to be cursed, <laughs> is, is the bottom in? Uh, well, we think it may take a few months, uh, but if, 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 if uh, let's say 2015, 16 is any, uh, any uh, comparison, it will probably be flattish for the next few months, but right. then, you'll see, uh, then you'll see a recovery that will be pretty sharp. In right. that case, like uh, after six months uh, in that 2015, 2016, from early 2016 to early 2018, the MSCI China doubled, actually. So it kind of creates the stage for the next set of growth. Hmm. You're still being quite defensive, though. You're focusing on the SOE's dividend plays, though. Not That's so a, much really going risk on. I think for the the next few months, uh, we're going to kind of feel the bottom at this point, right? Okay. So I think any of these uh, high dividend uh, SOE uh, companies like the big five Chinese banks or the big uh, uh, oil companies like Sinopec or the big steel companies like uh, Nanjing Iron Steel, five to eight percent dividend yield when the government bond is uh, yielding two and a half percent looks pretty good. That's not very sexy, though. <laughs> I, I, this is not the part of the mark. This is not the part of the cycle that you want to be too sexy. You want to kind of uh, okay. maintain uh, maintain the carry uh, and then uh, wait for the broader recovery to occur. Well, okay. Speaking of non-sexy, thirty-year CGBs. <laughs> do you think we take out the lows there? Ten-year CGBs yeah. that yield there were closer at record low. Does that rally continue? Uh, I, I think there's more room because uh, uh, the government bond yields are somewhat related to inflation, right? So inflation last year in China was only 0.2 percent. Mm. Uh, yeah, they'll put the 3 percent ceiling in probably this year, but it'll be a ceiling. So I think until you get more aggregate demand, uh, real inflation will be relatively low. So therefore, there'll be more room for government bond yields to come down, whether it's the 10-year, whether it's a 30-year. So, you know, I, I, we were talking about this uh, in the last three years. If you had put money in the 30-year government bonds uh, in China, you would have made about 25 percent uh, uh, appreciation. I think there's more room to go just because they need to print all this uh, uh, central and local government bonds that I mentioned before, something mm -hmm. like four trillion uh, this year, renminbi. Um, so it's a, it's to their incentive to keep rates relatively low. Mm -hmm.
who's going to be driving that, these gains that you're seeing, whether it is stocks or bonds? Do you think it's mostly going to be onshore investors, or are, are you seeing any signs of foreign flows coming back in a meaningful way? Uh, well, foreign flows definitely uh, reduced and, and, flew, uh, and uh, kind of there was outflows uh, in the last couple of years. I think it's going to be domestic uh, uh, investors uh, joining, joining this um, uh, rally first, and they're going to uh, benefit first. Uh, first of all, they're, they're closer to the action, and they're probably going to have more confidence to participate either in the government bonds or in the equity markets. Uh, so it'll be, you'll see, for example, the equity market, you'll probably see the onshore uh, indices like the CSI 300 and 500 do better than the offshore indices like the uh, uh, HSCI or, the, uh, uh, or even the uh, MSCI China. So you'll see a bit of a divergence in performance more onshore. Mm -hmm. But I think as that gains momentum over the next three months, six months, then you'll see the foreign flows come back in. I think that's the two-step process. Right. In that window, though, we have elections coming through in the U.S. in, what, seven, eight months from now. And yeah. that seems to to be at risk, at least for foreign investors. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I, I think so. I think so. I think, uh, you know, if, if you look at something as simple as the dollar renminbi, right? Mm. Right now it's been in this tight range, 715 to 725. Hasn't, hasn't moved. Yeah. Has, has almost not moved. And, and uh, uh, the fixing by PBOC has been around 710, so that hasn't moved either. So it seems like it satisfies uh, uh, both sides to keep it in that range. But if you get a, if you get a Trump election uh, later in the year and he increases tariffs, then you could see renminbi uh, depreciate uh, quite a bit uh, going going into next year. On the other hand, if the Fed starts cutting rates in the second half of this year and dollar starts to weaken, you can see the dollar renminbi actually come down. The, the renminbi will appreciate versus the dollar. So there's, there's an impetus that could lead it in either direction, actually. What, what do your Chinese clients think about a potential rematch between Trump and Biden? Yeah. Do, they, do they favor one or the other? I don't think they favor one or the other. They're not voting. So. <laughs> but, I mean, in terms of what it would mean for the economy, right? If we're talking about more yeah. tariffs from Trump. Yeah, and well, the what's like. the preference? Yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, it's mixed. It's mixed, which is surprising because you would have thought people uh, would be a little bit nervous about Trump with his hard talk on China and everything. But if you actually look at it, Biden kept all the tariffs that uh, Trump kept sure. in and added a few more, actually added a few more uh, restrictions uh, like on the semiconductors and stuff. Uh, there's a view from at least some of the private enterprises in China that Trump is a businessman. You can negotiate with him, actually. And he'll be just as tough on trade and defense on Europe as he will be on China, actually. <laughs> so it'll be harder for him to form a coalition maybe to uh, uh, to, to to, uh, to tackle China on trade, whereas he'll just be tough on everybody. So China will feel like they can gravitate toward other areas. What mm -hmm. I was saying before is that you're starting to see investments in other parts of the world. So BYD just opened up, uh, start, is building a factory in Hungary, actually. They're going to build cars out of Hungary. Uh, or um, Volkswagen just put a 5% stake investment in Xiaopeng. So you're starting to see a lot more cross-border cooperation between China and Europe, China and Southeast Asia, China and the Middle East, because they're anticipating a little bit more geopolitical uh, uh, tension from the U.S. Right. So, so if, if the EV conversation now is a product of the past decade's industrial push, what do you think the next decade's going to look like? What is that industrial push? AI. AI? <laughs> and how do you play it? Do I, do I play AI in China? Well, uh, I think they're trying. I think AI, they're trying, but uh, the big Biggest companies are not there right now. Actually, mm. they can produce the chips, but not at the cutting level of an Nvidia or some of the Taiwanese. So I think mm. uh, there, there are many. Just like they were probably about five years behind on the uh, on, on the uh, on the five uh, nanometer, nanometer chips, mm. uh, they're probably further behind on the AI. So they're they're working on that, but that will take some time. Okay. And you're seeing a lot of price competition, a lot not of just price the EV space, e-commerce as well. Yeah, actually, you know, people buy a lot of things on Taobao, JD, Pingdodo. For the first time, you're starting to see them do price matches. So yeah. if you see a lower price at another platform, they'll match the prices. That's probably not a that's, that that will help the business grow, but uh, the margins will be uh, compressed. Do you think uh, this is? Uh bit random, but do you think that's why there's no inflation in China right now? Because the market is just, just too efficient at finding that best price? Hmm. Yeah, I think even the most popular uh, uh, sectors actually, they're so, uh, it's so competitive in pricing. Like EVs, prices have come down probably 10 to 20 percent in the last two years actually. And Tesla's been driving a lot of the price uh, declines. Uh, so if, if uh, in either your consumer durables or consumer uh, 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 staples, uh, the prices are coming down, it's very hard for hmm. inflation to, uh, to drive. To fire up. And also, there's not a lot of wage pressure going up right now either. So inflation is very moderate, actually. Hmm. I was going to, I mean, people talk about whether what you're seeing portfolio flows, right? Like, it, it may not be a zero-sum game where, you know, I, I'm going to not buy China, I'm going to buy Japan, I'm going to buy U.S. in particular. But I want to broaden it out a little bit in some ways. Hmm. 
you know, with the U.S. equity market, are you seeing euphoria right now? I mean, it's euphoria, all-time high. Uh, Japan's at a 35-year yeah. high. Europe is almost at an all-time high. So, uh, yes, you put some there, but I think you have to look at the things that are undervalued, like China right now, especially if they're going to put in some new policies to, to call the bottom and say, okay, yeah. uh, you know, enough is enough. How important is it to the China story that the Fed cuts rates? Hmm. Um, it's important, but it's not essential, I think. I think, uh, I think it's important to everybody around the world. <laughs> a lot of people are, yeah. are doing a carry trade right now with the high yield uh, in U.S. assets and the low yield everywhere else to fund. Uh, so it's not just uh, China, but I think it would help a lot because if uh, the U.S. starts lowering rates in the second half of the year, then it'll be easier for uh, PBOC China to lower rates as well without having even a bigger uh, interest rate differential. Actually. Right. We forgot to ask your deputy CEO, now, how does it feel to run a bank in China now? Uh, well, you know, Know, there's uh, uh, what you have to do is uh, there's a lot of lending that you need to do to the real sector, actually the real economy, and there's pressure to do that because that's how the real economy is going to recover. And hopefully we get to the latter. Thank you, uh, George. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Let's Thank you. Soon. Thank you, David. Thanks. Uh, George Sun, there, deputy CEO of China, head of global markets for Greater China. There, we're looking at what a couple of minutes in, just almost 12 minutes into the session here. Check out some of these names are flying out of the gates here. These are property names. 16% for Sifi. Uh, Shermao is up about 10%. Developers index that. That sort of aggregates everything as well. Uh, we're down about half of 1% as far as that's concerned. There we go. Yep, coming up, China's growth target. We have energy transition. All these efforts will be top of mind for commodity investors watching the MPC. We have details coming up next. This is Bloomberg. All right, we're checking when it comes to commodities here this morning. So iron ore and steel slightly lower, about 1% or so. Uh, Shanghai crude, that's one to watch here, of course, after OPEC Plus came out over the weekend to extend those curbs and output curbs here until at least the summer. They're talking about June here, and Russia certainly putting their support around that one. So you are seeing uh, you know, crude markets slightly elevated here this morning. Of course, not just OPEC. It's really about NPC as well, China's growth target for the year and how it plans to get there, plus the speed speed of the energy transition will be top of mind for commodity investors watching the MPC. Joining us now is our senior editor for China Energy and Commodities, Jason Rogers. Jason, great to have you back in the program. So in terms of what commodity markets are watching out for, what are they looking at when it comes to the MPC this week? Well, I think uh, the, the two things that you've highlighted are, are crucial. The growth target. Uh, how China plans to, to meet that growth target and also any signs that the energy transition uh, is accelerating are probably the, the headlines that uh, commodities investors are looking at. Uh, if you think about uh, metals markets in particular, I think they're on tenter hooks uh, in terms of how China is going to look at the infrastructure situation. Obviously, you've had a collapse in housing. Uh, that's really affected metals demand, and I think there are some hopes, at least, uh, that uh, China will look to counter that with increased uh, infrastructure spending, uh, and these are the policies that are probably going to be setting the direction for metals markets going forward. Jason, what China does, and I'll bring in the climate conversation now, what China does affects what the rest of the world does, to be completely honest. And, and I'm wondering whether we see a trade-off between China's climate policies and really where they need to be as far as growth is concerned, because that seems to be in a cyclical sort of slowdown at the moment. Yeah, that's right. And I think what you've seen over the last uh, five-year plan that began in uh, 2021, you've actually seen some backsliding by China on some of its some of its energy targets, some of its climate targets, uh, particularly around energy intensity. Uh, and so I think there are some expectations that climate uh, issues will swing back to the fore at the MPC, and that will have uh, implications for how China grows the economy, because obviously if you're going to uh, look at carbon-heavy growth, and that goes back to the infrastructure thing that I was talking about earlier, uh, that's going to make it difficult to meet your energy intensity targets. Uh, so I think there's going to be some calibration between growth policies uh, and climate policies when the MPC meets. How about energy and food security, Jason? Um, energy security concerns haven't gone away, although obviously uh, we've seen you know, declines in energy prices since the spikes that we saw when Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, but I think what we're going to see is certainly on the oil and gas side, uh, you know, demands that um, production is kept elevated, for example, so that China can cut its import bill. 
I think probably more interesting is going to be the coal market. Uh, China is running up against a deadline to start using less coal uh, by 2025 uh, in order to meet its climate targets. So you're probably going to see coal production flatten. Uh, we've already had some of the local uh, mining hubs make that point ahead of the MPC, and that's probably going to be taken up uh, at a national level by the Congress. Uh, in terms of food security, uh, it's quite a draw on government finances. Uh, a lot of the disasters that have occurred because of climate change uh, affecting farming. Uh, and so we may have uh, a situation where the government looks to deploy more money on that, for example. Jason. Great stuff, as always. Tracian Rogers there joining us to talk things, all things commodities as it pertains to this quite material week as far as uh, policy, China policy is concerned there. Right, uh, let's get to some big political stories we're tracking at this point in time. Donald Trump says that he will impose tit-for-tat tariffs if he is re-elected as U.S. president, reiterating an isolationist policy goal that's already raised concern at home and also overseas. Now, Trump has previously suggested raising tariffs on Chinese goods by more than 60 percent, as well as revoking the global superpower's most favored nation status for U.S. trade. He has also floated a 10 percent tariff on all goods imported into the U.S. Now, U.S. Republican presidential hopeful Nikki Haley is signaling she may decline to endorse Donald Trump in an election rematch with Joe Biden, she told NBC she no longer considers herself bound by a pledge to support the party's 2024 nominee. Haley's comments come after Trump said he would nominate his daughter-in-law to co-lead the Republican National Committee. Yep, speaking of Nikki Haley, this just dropping your Bloomberg here right now. Uh, now she has won the Republican primary in the District of Columbia. So not that is her first victory in this 2024 campaign and maybe a sign at least halting some of the momentum that we've seen when it comes to the former President Donald Trump's sweep of the GOP voting contest. Of course, as we count down, to our special coverage of Super Tuesday that's going to be happening. We're going to keep you up on, on to the minute on what's been going on there and what will be happening. Voters will be casting ballots and nominee contests across 15 states. That starts at 10 a.m. on Wednesday in Hong Kong time, 1 p.m. if you're joining out of Sydney. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Dave, you know it is the, the China Show. It's our new first episode, you can call it here. And you know, now that we're doing two hours, I think we have plenty more time to fill, right? Yeah. Including time for us to actually scour through some of these local papers and what local media in China is talking about here, and what's really trending on on Weibo, social media as well. Markets are in focus that have the NPC opening on Tuesday, and that's what we're hearing from the Shanghai Securities News. The officials are continuing to work to eliminate hidden obstacles for medium and long-term funds to enter that market. What else are you watching out? For? Yeah. I mean, but the paper is also reporting here multiple institutions. I think they're talking about funding conditions, of mm. course, in this market here. Asia companies improving significantly. That's an outlook. That's an outlook, a statement of, of, of fact here still. Uh, or yet, at least. The brokerages also see the liquidity impact from the recent position adjustment by quant funds as mm. being over with the market's risk appetite increasing now. So that's in papers. Now, when we look at social media on Weibo, people are posting about issues. And, of course, this looks into the NPC and the two sessions this week here. What are people most concerned about as lawmakers gather to discuss the these key issues affecting the population and among the key issues as one would expect given the softness in the economy housing and also employment the discussion has garnered get this more than 30 million views so far and that is that number is actually increasing literally as we speak it's exactly what George Sun from BGP Paribas was just saying mm -hmm. right that a lot of the job you know the wages and what we're seeing and the job growth that you're seeing is mostly been attuned to the prop uh, the, the services sector here right now yeah. in terms of the private sector and, and really can we reinvigorate that side of it where you know a lot of young people when they are graduating want, wanted to go and work for a tech company for example mm -hmm. I mean that sort of animal spirits, I don't think, has quite come back just yet. Maybe that's what we're really hanging really closely to here yeah, when I think it comes to the two sessions and the like. We're 22 percent, I believe, on the youth unemployment, yeah. the last print that they put out uh, as well. And so, so, by the way, this is interesting because, you know, we've been talking about the growth target and the, and the work report. They also come out with the target of the number of urban jobs they want to create. Mm -hmm. That's usually 10 to 11 million annually that goes into the conversation that you brought up with George Sun that, you know, this urbanization rate has certainly slowed down in the last two years or so and that's contributed to this 
housing market that's yeah. yet to find its footing as well. It's an interesting take, right, given the structural demographic challenges that, that you can't quite subscribe the same sort of policy playbook as you did hmm. back when there was a whole shantytown development, the like, because less people are getting married, as you say. Less people are having kids here right now, so that is still one to watch. All right, markets are doing this. We're watching very closely these uh, Chinese developers Speaking here of. right now. So Sifi holding Shimao. So why we're seeing such outsized gains is because they were included back into that southbound connect. So that's why you're seeing Sifi holdings in double digits, up close to 20% here right now. The opposite is true when you look at the bigger names that we talk about mostly, Country Garden and Vancouver. We're looking at crypto-related shares, as you can see some green here some tailwinds coming through and you have some of the names listed across the Asia Pacific and Korea bottom of your screens Bitcoin we're testing 635 64,000 of course is the next perhaps level to watch as it pertains to this and just looking at broader broader markets here in Hong Kong and up in China as well there we go half of 1% so we have reversed the early strength we've seen across some of the sector groups as well 10 year yield currently at 2.36 percent coming up one sticking to their bullish call on Chinese equities, the other a little bit more defensively positioned. We're going to take a deep dive into China markets just ahead with Goldman Sachs and B of A Securities together. Yep, we'll have a lot more on the way in the next hour. You're watching The China Show. Good morning and welcome back to the program. Live pictures of the Chinese capital there in Beijing, just outside, of course, the Forbidden City. We're looking ahead to the opening here of the CPPCC in the main event. This time, tomorrow, the National People's Congress. Welcome back. This is The China Show, our very first edition. So welcome to our second hour, of course. We're watching very closely across these markets. you got China stocks and the renminbi ahead of the NBC looking like this here right now. We're pretty flat when it comes to CSI 300. And you're seeing some declines here across the board when it comes to Shanghai Composite, the Hang Seng as well. But we're talking Japan. That continues to be a positive story there. New milestone this morning, 40,000. Nikkei 225. Futures are pointing there at the open. We hit that within a couple of minutes. Nikkei, as you can see, at 40,226 uh, right now. And also talking about other stories affecting markets. And over the weekend, of course, we're looking also at what's happening in the energy markets, too. Yeah, OPEC Plus extending those oil supply cuts to June. I mean, that was expected. Just given the seasonal lull we've seen when it comes to uh, consumption of energy of late here. And really, you're starting to see some of these energy names and the like here. So Brent markets are doing pretty well here. And we're taking a look at, of course, just given the Middle East tensions, that oil price has been pretty solid around 80 bucks thanks to these supply cuts. But speaking of those Middle East talks, uh, we're hearing from Hamas sending a team to Cairo as Israel does seek a hostage's status. Lots to consider. Hope you're all well. Had a restful weekend. We're looking at markets as we get underway this week. Certainly some caution is well, caution dominating the Chinese markets. We opened slightly higher on benchmarks here in Hong Kong, have since reversed most of that strength. We're still looking at the property space, uh, and we'll talk more about that later, certainly within the context of what was announced here in Hong Kong uh, last week. But all that being said, there's also a big week ahead. ECB. Uh, Jay Powell is set to speak, of course, uh, ahead of Congress there, well, in front of Congress, rather, and certainly markets have listened, and the nuance is they've actually listened and continued to push this equity market up as we've repriced the possibility of three cuts, in some cases maybe no cuts as well, no landing, at least no runway is inside. Anyway, we'll talk more about China, of course, at the moment. NPC, in fact, Stephen Engel is with us live out of Beijing right now to talk us through, of course, Steve, Steve big week where you are. Yeah, it is a big week. Uh, today is the launch, of course, of the advisory body, which coincides with the National People's Congress. I'm talking about the CPPCC. We'll be in Tiananmen Square later this afternoon, where all the delegates will be flowing through the, the square and up the steps of the Great Hall of the People, uh, and then discuss the challenges, obviously, and the opportunities that uh, the economy and the, uh, if, if stimulus or uh, confidence-boosting measures, uh, what that will uh, translate to uh, the broader economy. Uh, that's what everybody is really looking forward to right now, and that is what kind of policy 
and direction and confidence boosting measures can Lee Chong deliver first of all tomorrow morning in his work report it will essentially be his first work report because uh, this was his first year on the job as uh, the premier it was Lee Ke Chong who had the uh, work report last year as he stepped down by the end of the National People's Congress and Lee Chong took over as premier so we'll be kind of uh, reading his words seeing if he strikes a similar tone as we got from Lee Ke Chong uh, from the the premier going forward, but yeah, it's a cold day today. Uh, sunny skies, but the security cordon is definitely tight all around the capital. As uh, these 3,000 plus delegates for the National People's Congress from around the country meet here in Beijing to discuss the economic priorities going forward. And again, we're likely to hear a, a, a terminology that Xi Jinping has used repeatedly over the last year, and that is high quality development. He said. 128 different times by Bloomberg's accounting last year, more than twice uh, the the number from 2022. So what does that mean? Well, it generally the consensus means that they'll accept lower GDP growth for the sake of longer and sustainable uh, development. Uh, but again. Four and a half, or about five percent, is the consensus estimate that we're likely to get for the GDP target in that annual work report tomorrow. Yeah, Steve, it's interesting you mentioned the number of times this sort of, uh, you know, quality growth has been reiterated from the president himself because markets are looking for something else. They're looking for pro-growth and a clear message that the, the you know the policymakers are clearly you know serious about reviving growth in China. So should we actually be tempering our expectations overall? I, I think we need to temper our expectations, and that's why the market, uh, up until, of course, the national team came in and uh, sort of gave a, a confidence boost to the markets in February, uh, generally investors have been quite wary, obviously. There has not been a big bang uh, bazooka, if you want to mix metaphors, as far as you know, fiscal stimulus. It's been piecemeal, a little bit, of course, on monetary, with banks also cutting, essentially, the loan prime rate tied to mortgages, the five-year LPR. That gave a a little bit of a boost, obviously, to property sentiment. But uh, many economists are saying much more needs to be done, uh, not just to boost the economy, but to boost confidence. And and which is, you know, which is comes first, the, the chicken or the egg or the horse or the cart? Because confidence will help lead to economic recovery. Economic recovery will lead to confidence. So, again, we're going to have to wait and see what is spelled out in that very lengthy work report. Uh, you know, we're going to get that. GDP target of around 5%, most likely. They might surprise us. Usually they don't surprise us uh, very much. They, they uh, pretty much stick to script, but most economists are saying it's going to be about uh, 5%. Also, we have to look at the, uh, the deficit target, uh, the target budget deficit to GDP, which last year was set at about 3%. We're hearing it could be closer to 4% this year. Again, there, there, there will likely be some stimulus measures in the, ter in, the, in the form of fiscal spending, incurring a little bit more debt. But again, the emphasis of Xi Jinping has been de-risk, de-leverage, in particular at the local level, because their coffers are extremely constrained, not only by three years of COVID zero policies, which they had to pay for, but the property mess has led to dwindling land sales. And that's how they re cover and recoup and, and fill their coffers through land sales. And they have obviously uh, been drying up. So lots to discuss to see how much more debt burden the central government is willing to incur at a time of deleveraging and de-risking. Yeah, it's interesting too, Dave. Steve mentioned about that fiscal sustainability, right? I mean, we heard that with Moody's when they downgraded the mm. outlook for China last year on the back of those concerns, right? So if, you know, A and Z, it's like, it's, it might be more likely we might see a 3% uh, de budget deficit versus three and a half or even higher because of those sovereign rating concerns now, Dave. Yeah, I think it's really where, who do you want to spend the money? Where do you want growth to come from? It's certainly not coming, Steve, I'll bring you in here at this point, for this point. It, it's really certainly not, not from the consumer. You know, people ask, where, where has growth gone? Well, my answer would be it's in the bank, right? People are not spending, to Steve's point, 
land revenues from land sales right. haven't picked up, hence this fiscal pinch that local governments are in. So my question, Steve, for you is we talked about all this top line and you know on the surface, what does it mean for consumers? Do we get anything that gets consumers spending again? Well, I've spent the weekend walking around the city and also talking to people. I've met a number of my old friends when I lived here as well. Uh, and they do feel the pain, and they're not necessarily opening up their wallet as much as they did before. I was up at an outlet area up in the northeast near the airport, which is usually absolutely jam-packed with shoppers uh, on a Sunday afternoon, a beautiful day yesterday. And I have to tell you, it was fairly empty. And those are those big-ticket places. There's the Prada and the other big Italian outlet brands. And there was just nobody walking around with bags full of goodies. So again, that's just sort of an anecdotal snapshot of the, the pain that the consumer and the lack of confidence that they have. Uh, but, you know, it's also tied to the private sector. The private sector through COVID and now with this economic malaise has really been hurt hard. And in July, the private sector essentially... From from the government got a 31 point uh, plan to rejuvenate the private sector but how is it being implemented has it as it hasn't necessarily uh, you know filtered down to the regular economy so it plays a big part 60 percent of GDP comes from the private sector 80 percent of urban jobs so that's what I want to hear from the work report tomorrow all right, Steve, thank you, Steve Ingo, our Chief North Asia Correspondent there, joining us live out of Beijing. And, of course, in terms of the week ahead, it's not just the MPC we talked about, right? So you have Powell's testimony later on this week. Uh, you have inflation numbers coming out when it comes to Japan, Philippines, South Korea, and Taiwan. Uh, obviously, Joe Biden at State of the Union on Thursday is one to watch as well. And we're also explaining some big, big, big central bank decisions. So ECB, Bank of Canada, Malaysia, in our neck of the woods here, a lot of signs of what they're going to do when it comes to the currency, just given what we saw last week, Dave. Yeah, they literally talked down the currency. <laughs> well, we'll talk, talk the currency up. And all the, of course, that takes us into the jobs report, which comes out on Friday. So quite a busy uh, week ahead. Right, just ahead, we'll take a, an extremely deep dive. I know we say that almost every day, but this one is deeper than usual. There we go, with in the Chinese markets, uh, with Goldman Sachs and Bofa Securities. Kim Jir Lao out of Goldman, Winnie Wu out of Bofa joins us. They both join us in the next few minutes or so to talk all things equity markets. This is The China Show on Bloomberg. The market focus will be very much on what specific measures or uh, tools they come up to support the economy. Um, at this moment, I think the focus will be on, you know, what's the official fiscal, you know, uh, deficit. So the policy pivot that we are expecting, and I think markets are looking for that around 5% growth target, um, around 3% uh, inflation uh, expectations, and also at the same time, more fiscal uh, policy measures that will support the overall growth momentum. If they actually say something a bit more firm, like really we're going to get to 5% no matter what, then you would expect a lot more stimulus than last year because it was such a low base effect last year, right? If they are a little bit more flexible or they even go lower and say 4.5%, then you know that they're going to focus on things more like national security and stability rather than economic growth. All right, some of our guests this morning as, of course, China's National People's Congress prepares to open in Beijing. And, yeah, we're bringing two people together, which was shocking to me, Dave, that they've never met before, even yeah. though they cover the same equity market, which is China. But we're bringing the best of the best. Yeah. Uh, and we're having a, a fire, <laughs> rapid-fire discussions and maybe dig a little bit more deeper into what NBC really means uh, for stocks here. I'm pleased to bring in Kinder Lau, Chief China Equity Strategist at Goldman Sachs. Along with him, we're pairing him with Winnie Wu, Chief China Strategist of B of a securities. Um, guys, it's a pleasure to have you on. Please, thank you so much for playing game with us. <laughs> this yeah. crazy idea that we had <laughs> to kick off our China show. Um, I'm going to ask you, I mean, obviously, everyone's been, you know, going to be hanging so closely to this work report and um, how big of an event this MPC is going to be for markets. But how important is it going to be as a catalyst for this equity rally to continue? Kendra, I'll start with you. It's, it's very important. Obviously, during the two sessions, we'll likely get more 
policy, information, uh, growth targets, everyone's so focused on that. I guess we're not too different from consensus when it comes to the actual numbers. Uh, so we're looking for around 5% growth mm. for 2024. And the other big number, of course, is fiscal deficit uh, to GDP ratio. We're looking for above 3% on budget fiscal deficit. Um, but I think the more important number that we are very focused on is the so-called augmented fiscal deficit, which means that we aggregate both on-budget and off-budget deficit mm -hmm. spending yeah. together. And that on that basis, we're looking for about 12% wow. deficit spending to GDP, which represents a, an incremental uh, expansion of fiscal policy relative to 2023. So from that basis, um, I think uh, if we get that number, uh, I think that will help, um, I would say, maybe uh, solidify it or just to improve confidence a little bit and to really stabilize growth expectation, uh, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to uh, corporate earnings growth expectation. Winnie. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, apparently this is something people are watching. Um, there are three issues with the market, as we discussed before. One is the continued property downturn, especially the depreciating asset prices creating a negative wealth effect on household. So for us, more specifically, you know, anything to help stabilize the property market, the confidence on the property market. Second, the longer term problem is, uh, you know, what is going to be the new growth driver? Is that AI? Is that new technology? And specifically, how is government policy going to promote innovation, promote China's development in those areas? But those two are really more longer term effect. But for the short term, the specific third area is more about rebuilding the confidence, right? The confidence of the private sector, about the, uh, the confidence of household. And along those lines, I think, you know, we would like to see whether there's more focus on pro-growth policies, whether there's more accommodative policies, more on opening up reforms. You're thinking when it comes to potential upside in this equity market, Winnie, it might just be sort of a L-shaped sort of can you walk us through why? Yeah, that's still our base case view because I would say fundamentally, you know, for the economy to turn around, it's not so much about stimulus. I mean, stimulus is important, but I think China has passed the stage where they want to throw a lot of money, build a lot of leverage just to achieve a, you know, 7%, 6% GDP growth. Current government focus on high quality growth. So I think from economy perspective, government policy is more likely about holding the floor rather than driving a, a very strong policy, uh, uh, economic recovery. And then in terms of the credit policy, also similarly, we're not expecting a strong Strong credit stimulus or policy bazooka. But mm. also importantly is from global investors' perspective, are the real money long-term global fund going to come back to buy China just because China announced a 10 trillion stimulus? Mm. Probably not good enough, right? So some of these fundamental turnaround just takes time in our yeah. view. Yeah, but you have a somewhat of an op I say opposite view, <laughs> somewhat of a more constructive view of, of equity markets. Well, we, we do share the, the L-shaped uh, pattern, but this is more for the property market. So okay. we've been very vocal about that. Yeah. We think the property market deleveraging will take a few years to, to play out. Um, but when it comes to the equity market, slightly different views, maybe it's more like a L-shaped, but we but inverted. Put it, uh, inverted yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So um, I think when you look at our targets, we're looking about for about 10% potential mm -hmm. price returns over the next 12 months for Chinese equities, both A and H. And I think the, the kind of the inputs to that view would be number one, uh, we still think that uh, this year earnings growth would be decent. We're looking for about 8 to 10% earnings growth. Mm -hmm. On top of that, valuations, I'm sure everyone knows that we are at pretty depressed level. Mm -hmm. uh, so nine times for MSCI China and about 10 times, 11 times for A shares. So that combination with uh, potential some policy support coming out from the two sessions, we think that we have a, a, a pretty good setup for the market to do better uh, in the next 10 to 12 months. Okay. Yeah, and I think one of the areas we just showed that we're, you guys somewhat diverge and we celebrate your differences, of course, <laughs> here, is, is the earnings outlook, yeah. right? So you have... Maybe single digits, low single digits. Low single digits. You almost have double digits, if not double digits. So, mm -hmm. where are you seeing the biggest earnings driver, and what's lacking still as far as the earnings push is concerned? What do you? Well, see? first of all, um, I think relative to consensus, we think consensus looks a little bit quite optimistic. Okay, compared to where to we 17%. are, 14, 15 percent for <laughs> both A and H. Okay. Uh, I, I think it's uh, quite, quite. Well, it's quite, always quite 14 percent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a magic um, number. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But when it comes to where 
we can we get growth from a corporate earnings standpoint? I would say number one, we think that the TMT sector will be still a, a pretty important growth contributor mm. to the market. We're looking for about mid-teens type of earnings growth for TMT sectors. On top of that, I think some consumer names um, and even like some SOEs, I think they'll, they'll be generating pretty decent uh, earnings growth for this year. But of course, when you zoom into the housing cohort, I think uh, equities related to the housing market will, will struggle to, to grow. Mm. What's the rest of all that, Woody? <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, if you look at the sequential trend, the question to ask ourselves is this year's earning growth going to be faster or slower than last year? And our answer is it's probably similar to slower, right? Because look, look at the, the major earning component. Financials consistently account for 40 to 50 percent of earnings within both the uni, uh, uh, MSA China universe and the Asia universe. Mm. And for major banks, earning growth this year is probably going to be slightly lower than last year. Uh, internet, autos, renewables, these sectors, the growth sectors also last year benefited from the high base because of the reopening, low base effect in 2022. But 24 versus 23 is likely to decelerate. Overall, GDP growth, we are also looking at a modest deceleration. So I would say this year, 24's earning growth is likely to be lower than 23. And consensus now looking at full year 23 MSI China earning growth, probably around 2%. So I would say 24, the reality, we might get 2% or even slightly lower. Ooh. Okay. Just like that so that keeps here. you defensive, I would imagine, right? Yes. So you still like... SOEs, high dividend place. You have this new report. Yeah. Yes. Tell SOE us about Reform 2.0 and the Fantastic Four sectors. Tell us about it. That's right. Um, so SOE has, has been a sector that global investors ignored, right? Generally, when global investors buy China, they like to buy growth. So internet, healthcare, autos, consumer, those hot growth sectors, which traded at much higher premium than SOE. But in the past two, three years, what we find is actually private sectors suffered much more derating because of slowdown, because of increased policy risk and elevated geopolitical tensions, whereas SOE sector has been outperforming, whether it's past three years, 10 years old, year to date. So the Fantastic Four sector are financial, telcos, utility, and oil and gas sectors. Within that, you know, coal sector year to date is up 20%. Oil sector up 20%. Even the banks is up 9% year to date when MSA China is down. And we think the story might continue this year. One is because we stay defensive as we are not so bullish on the growth outlook. But also, you know, SASEC, the state administrator for the SOEs, in end of January actually launched a new initiative similar to what Japan and Korea is doing. Mm -hmm. It's basically encouraging or urging SOEs to focus on unlocking your value, unlocking, you know, the, the, the mar uh, driving the multiple re-rating. So, you know, whether it's enhance the communication with investor or increase buyout, uh, increase dividend payout, or even do more buybacks, we think there could be more of those initiatives to drive more return. And not that it's a zero-sum game as far as, you know, strategies concerned, but what do you think would be the winning strategies? If, if not this, what would that be? Well, uh, first of all, I, I, I would concur with Vinny's, Vinny's You're view about... You're really polite, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think cash, div cash returns, when okay. it comes to dividend payments and, and buybacks, mm -hmm. Would be uh, something that we, we like on a global basis, not only in China, but we also like that in the U.S. We like it in, in Europe as well. So we're not too uh, different from that perspective. But as I said, I don't think it's a binary decision when it comes to how to invest or allocate capital in the Chinese equity market. So on, on besides like high dividend yields and SOEs, I, I think there are also quite attractive opportunities in the POE sector. As I mentioned earlier, we think that TMT sector is still. Um, generating pretty decent growth and trading at very depressed valuations and some really big companies are engaging more actively in buybacks. So if you want to get additional cash returns, I think that's the that's yeah. place you want to look at as well. All right, we're going to do a bit of a, before we go, we've got to do a bit of rapid fire questions um, to get your take on it. So I'm going to ask one question. You guys mm. both just kind of chime in first. Well, I'll have Kendra first, but yeah. where am I likely to get better returns, A or H shares? Uh, on a technical basis, we like A. Uh, but on a 12-month basis, we think both markets would generate about 10% returns. 12-month uh, basis, A, but in the risk on trade, so for trading opportunity, better beta in H. Okay. China tech or U.S. tech, Kinger? <laughs> Next 12 months, better return. 12 <laughs> months. Uh, we like both. Okay. Winnie? Uh, consensus would definitely say U.S. tech. Yeah. China tech, we would be, well, 
both very selective. U.S. tax is cut narrow to even less than magnificent <laughs> seven, right? But China tech, we like a few selective names that can defend the market share and defend the margins. Very selective. Guys, fantastic. Thank you so yes. much for your time. Let's do this again. Kinder Law, Goldman Sachs, and Winnie Wu there out of both of securities. There's plenty more ahead. The full market roundup. Everything that's taking place this Monday. Happy Monday to all of you, by the way. Thanks for joining us. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. All right, we're checking Hong Kong property developers here this morning. Look at Midland Holdings. They're surging some 23%. This is, of course, the property broker. So they've been seeing a surge of requests for people to look at homes. But after post this uh, budget that came out from Hong Kong, uh, Henderson Land had a big project that was basically sold out in hours. We're watching the chip space, just given what we saw with the Dell earnings, really being lifted here by that AI boost. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to shows. It's just uh, 11.29 in the morning there in Tokyo. We are headed into the lunch break. If anyone told you, as perhaps recently as two years ago, whether the Nikkei would be back at 40,000 ever, they'd probably hit you on the head and call you crazy, call you maybe, maybe never. Uh, <laughs> there we go. But here we are, right? 40,000 was the milestone we hit a couple of minutes after the opening bell early on. Unsurprisingly so, this march towards this milestone. The rest of the region doing very well, though, as well. 40,000. Yeah, I mean, you have the likes of BlackRock, Amundi. They're still expecting its earnings growth. You have changes in corporate gu governance. That certainly is going to lead the strength moving forward. So maybe there is still some juice in this. It seems like we're seeing that here today once again. We're inching close to 3,000 for the topics as well. Hmm. Your Asia dashboard looking like this here right now. So Japan's doing great. When it comes to this equity market, the rest of the region is still looking good. And, you know, we've talked about, what, 16 weeks of gains of the last 18 when it comes to stocks globally. Uh, equities certainly have been the outperformer here year to date. U.S. futures, of course, are flat there, but we certainly did reach a 15 straight record when it comes to the S&P as well. I believe it was B of A. They're, they're bringing up their forecast now once again. And the Bloomberg dollar index is pretty much flat here, but you're seeing a bid when it comes to Infotech. So tech, chip plays the like here. Uh, also, when it comes to, uh, we're watching very closely what's going on in property in China, as well as in Hong Kong as well too, Dave. Yeah, some big movers still about an hour into the session here. Cash market session. Yvonne was pointing out where we are with the dollar. A lot of that will have, will depend probably on what the ECB does this week, the jobs report. That aside though, within the region, again, more signs of momentum coming through in the market. So last week, and pay attention to volumes this week, we hit a three-year high on the Asia-Pacific. 210 billion shares traded on the benchmark last week. That takes you all the way back to 2021. So certainly there is a lot more participation taking place in this market. We're up six straight weeks now on the regional benchmark. Now, apart from this, global markets will also be tracking, closely watching the NPC, China's NPC, to be more specific here for fresh policy direction for an economy really facing turmoil in its property market. You have weak consumer confidence, you have persistent deflation, and also geopolitical concerns. Our chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel, outlines the priorities at this year's two sessions. Early spring's cross currents in Beijing can be tough to read, as China faces a host of economic headwinds ahead of the annual session of parliament, the National People's Congress. With property market turmoil, poor consumer confidence, persistent deflation, destabilized geopolitical ties, along with plummeting FDI, and a rocky stock market, simply put, it's not been a good first year for President Xi Jinping since taking a precedence busting third consecutive term last March. The economy is still tough, it's slowly recovering, but I think the confidence has not come back. So far, state-directed funds have mobilized to stabilize wobbly markets, while Beijing replaced the head of the securities regulator and cracked down on so-called malicious short-selling. Banks, too, eased a loan prime rate tied to mortgages, and consumers came back and spent mightily. During the week-long Lunar New Year holiday, the best set of spring festival numbers since pre-COVID. But was it all enough to turn the winter bears into spring bulls? 2023 has been an unfortunate confluence in China of deflation and de-risking. Um, I think this year the policymakers want to go back into reflation and hopefully reform. In terms of the ability of these measures to really change the market sentiment, we are slightly more cautious. Uh, because what's really needed is a change in the uh, inflation outlook for the country and the 
overall sentiment in the private sector. You've got sentiment which is rock bottom uh, and at the same time I think the issue is of policy credibility in the market. The growth engine remains one where it's more let's say government-led, infrastructure-led, manufacturing and investment-led uh, and, and those might help to get to the growth target uh, but in terms of the more dynamism and, and the more sustainable type of growth uh, we think it's, it still needs some work. So attention now turns to Premier Li Chang's work report on day one of the NPC. Post-holiday, Li called for, quote, pragmatic and forceful action to boost confidence. But how? So far, there's been no big bang policy move as leaders stress de-risking and deleveraging with fiscal strain in property and at local governments. Instead of looking for more candies from the government, we really want to say, can we actually go back to more like what China started in its reform back in the early 1980s? It's more, you know, allow the private uh, enterprises, entrepreneurs to the right incentive to, to really to do things, the freedom. Wishful thinking, perhaps, for global investors who got burned by multiple stresses on China's private sector, including COVID zero and a regulatory takedown of big tech. We've been out of China for a long time. We um, essentially started getting nervous about China when Jack Ma was hauled in. So that was in 2020, a very long time ago. And uh, for the past year and a half or two, we've had no exposure in China, none whatsoever. The world is watching Beijing's next policy move, perhaps at the NPC, with great interest. And that was our chief major correspondent, Stephen Engel, with a preview, of course. And for more on what we're looking out for this week in Beijing, let's bring in our Bloomberg Economics' Eric Ju joining us as well. I think investors are looking for a clear pro-growth signal. Like, are we likely going to get it? Eric is one thing. And what would be setting that message? I think the most important signal is on the growth target right, for the market to understand what's going, the, the government is trying to achieve this year. But I think now it's a quite consensus, probably the target is still around 5%. It's unlikely to be lower than last year, so that, that will be another bend to confidence, right? If the mm -hmm. government not even trying to achieve 5%, that's, that's, that's a nightmare probably for the market. But I think it's also unlikely to be you know, very high above 5%. That, that would be more challenging. I think this is already still a tough year, like Steve mentioned, so lots of challenge. I think 5% uh, would be quite pragmatic, uh, and also I think it's still achievable if they step up with more policy easing, right? even without a big bang of the stimulus somebody is, is, is expecting. So a 5% growth target this year because of the sort of high base we're coming off from last year. Yeah. What, what policy support does that imply? I think uh, it's probably what mean a little bit more uh, policy support than last year, especially mm -hmm. on the fiscal side, because uh, we observed that last year actually the fiscal spending was quite slow at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. So some of the funding might be, you know, uh, delayed to this year. So even if we don't see a very high, uh, very high headline fiscal budget deficit, that the de facto, you know, fiscal spending could be more than last year because some of the funding were not used last year would be move to this year. So, so I think the fiscal will definitely be more than last year and the monetary easing probably also, you know, a bit more than last year after we have seen uh, quite, PBOC has moved uh, quite more than market expected at the beginning of this year. So we would expect that they continue with the easing steps. But uh, overall, we, I, I would say we, we don't say, you know, a big bang stimulus, right? Mm -hmm. It's still government would be trying to step by step, incremental and depending on market condition, depending on the activity growth, growth numbers. So yeah, but they would, I think compared to last year, they would try to spend more uh, earlier, spend much faster than last year, trying to boost up the uh, growth number as early as possible. Yeah. Should we just assume that the debt size will, will rise inevitably? I mean, I think it was around like 56%, I think, of debt to GDP ratio last year but are we are we likely to see that be higher uh, I think it's it's unlikely to be you know jump very high because the government already said very clear they're going to try to deleverage right it's just still on the deleveraging path and uh, 
I think there are some local level. Just start, we start to see some policies, uh, the government, local government trying to resolve the uh, local debt issues, right, at least uh, step by step. But uh, we would hope to see you know, some more high level you know, yeah. plans trying to solve the debt problems. We, I, I, I don't know if we can see any uh, clues from that from tomorrow, but uh, we hope uh, the government is moving on the direction, trying to have a high level plan. Yeah. Eric? You'll be busy this week. We'll let you go, of course. Chat more, of course, throughout the course of this week. Eric Chu, they're out of Bloomberg Economics. Now, just ahead here, as the NPC prepares to open in Beijing, that opens, of course, tomorrow, we'll look at why Hong Kong and the Greater Bay Area may get plenty of attention this year. That's next. You're watching The China Show. Welcome back to the China Show. You're looking at live pictures of a, a pretty foggy sort of Hong Kong morning here right now, but flat when it comes to uh, Henning Seng as well. It's a little bit foggy when it comes to where the direction of travel is going to be for this week, of course, as we count down to the NPC this week. We're tra tracking very closely what's been going on when it comes to some of these developers, though, here in the city. It's been a busy weekend, I believe, when it comes to some of the brokerages out there, real estate agents. You have Henderson Land's latest residential project. I might be butchering this. Bill Gravia Place. <laughs> reportedly sold out within hours. As one would name within hours. their project. Here in Hong of the launch of its first round sale. This was one of the first major projects we've seen after we heard from Paul Chan, right, of basically nixing all these property curves. And already it's taking an immediate effect. Already, yeah. People are jumping at this. Anecdotally, the people that you spoke with, um, randomly, I'm just going to share this with you guys, my, my broker, as one does, uh, I was exchanging messages with him. Just curious to see what the how it's actually changed for you know brokerages on the ground right yeah. so we talked about this one stock uh, midland is up what 20 percent or 90 percent nuts yeah um uh, he said he hasn't gotten sleep since thursday okay because it's just been non-stop calls non-stop lists people inquiry so far yeah so there's really been money sitting on the sidelines but his, his other point was rates are still high. Yeah. So don't expect people to lock in these mortgage rates at this point. But people are starting to look, in every, especially if you have the cash to yeah. just uh, take it all, as they say. The removal of the, the chili peppers, right? I mean, that's what they call it here in Hong Kong. <laughs> The chili. The red hot. It's, 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 yeah. All right. Let's take a look when it comes to uh, what we've been seeing, of course, NPC, the like here. So we've been hearing a little bit more from a spokesperson mm. from China's People's Political Consultative Conference, Good one. CP, C, PCC, mm. mind you, says that the economic output of the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area has surpassed $1.8 trillion. That's according to a report from Chinese state media. And the area is said to be among the topics of discussions at the NPC as Beijing looks to ramp up economic integration in the greater bay area yep let's bring in our team to discuss really how this features into the conversations broader conversations this week joining us here china economy and government editor alan wong and also shuli ren our bloomberg opinion columnist with us to talk us through this Al alan i'll start with you certainly the shenzhen has become just across of course the border from where we are here has become a feature of many hong kongers weekend gimmicks <laughs> hasn't it Yes, indeed. We're seeing a record number of Hong Kongers traveling across the border into Shenzhen uh, over weekends and holidays. Uh, so much so that uh, we're hearing from some bar owners that they now dread weekends because <laughs> the bars are now empty. Yeah. And they're going to Costco, right? I mean, that's what I hear. And everything's cheaper when it comes to trips and, and you know, eating and all that. I mean, I, I hear so many people in Hong Kong heading over there for the weekend now. Yeah, and it's not just the prices are cheaper. I mean, they've always been, Shenzhen has always been cheaper than Hong Kong, but now um, Shenzhen has caught up to Hong Kong mm -hmm. with all of its options of uh, food and entertainment. And the shopping malls are as good as Hong Kong's. And yeah. if you live, you know, just not too far away from the border, why wouldn't you spend your weekends there, right? And then with new infrastructure like the high speed railway, and uh, if you drive the new uh, mega bridge that connects Zhuhai and uh, Macau in Hong yeah. Kong, um, you could just drive across the border with the right license and you could spend weekends uh, there in a very nice day trip. I don't know how I'm going to keep you know, my bulk order of toilet paper from Costco in my apartment in Hong Kong. Though. Yeah. Well, how much, this doesn't quite add up well, in terms of space. How much, how much toilet paper does the man household I mean, typically go I mean, you're going to go all the way to Shenzhen. Uh, okay. You've got to stock up on some TP, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, well, that's interesting because so, uh, not a lot of people understand. The, I mean, there are many places, highly populated parts of Hong Kong, that are actually nearer to Shenzhen yes. than it is here to Hong Kong Island, yes. right? So that's it. I mean, there's just a border, but as you said, you know, the license, if you have the license, that's, it's almost an over. <laughs> surely, surely I'll bring you in. This is, all, this is a deliberate 
blueprint anyway, the greater Bay Area. Yeah. Hong Kong is simply part of this broader blueprint. Yes, absolutely. It's a. Uh, I mean, we are seeing actually the Greater Bay Area starts to be working. Like China has been talking about for almost uh, ten years, right? Mm. And then only this year, because of China's. Uh, uh, deflationary pressure. We are actually seeing Hong Kong people going to mainland China to consume and spend. Is it uh, good so for Hong Kong then, you think? I think it depends on who is answering the question. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. the retailers in Hong Kong, they're not going to be happy. Like Kuan Fong is quite uh, empty, to be honest, these days, right? Like, mm -hmm. and then whereas in Shenzhen, the bars are very, very full. But uh, I think, uh, I mean, Hong Kong, the government is entering a structural uh, fiscal deficit because we are just such an aging society. I mean, life expectancy expectancy for an average Hong Kong woman is 87 years. I don't want to live for that long. <laughs> and, and then like 40% of our fiscal expenditure is uh, recurring. Basically, we're paying for public health, right? Like uh, hospitals, etc., etc. But these days, the Hong Kong government is starting to say, okay, if you're elderly, we're going to give you a consumption coupon to allow you to access the hospitals in Shenzhen and Guangzhou because uh, healthcare is cheaper. You can have bigger apartments there. So I think in, in some sense, Hong Kong's Asian society problem can be partially resolved if a lot of our elderly go move to Greater Bay Area and enjoy the health care there. Hmm. Yeah, well, it brings to mind what the broader role of Hong Kong then is. What does it become under long... And we, we talk about NPC just to put mm -hmm. that in context, right? You know, where does GBA lie in this conversation? Where does Hong Kong lie within GBA? What would be the role of Hong Kong? I think uh, Hong Kong's uh, edge has always been uh, wealth management, right? Okay. Like not, not for our uh, local community, but for wealthy foreigners and the uh, wealthy mainland Chinese. And what we saw was that uh, Hong Kong was uh, uh, raising the, the, the investment quota for mainland Chinese who want to invest uh, through the Wealth uh, Management Connect. And the, the appetite has been very, very strong because in Hong Kong, we can get 4%, whereas in China, we all know, like, you cannot even get 2% for three months. So, so I think that's perhaps the edge of Hong Kong, you know, like uh, asset management industry. And uh, perhaps we just don't have anything more, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alan, I'll Come bring on, you in. There were some interesting you know, comments that came in from the interview with, with uh, the U.S.'s diplomat in Hong Kong, Mr. Gregory May, talking about just the, the growing concern when it comes to internet censorship in, in the city. That was quite interesting. What was your, some of the key takeaways from that for you? Yeah, that was the main takeaway, because uh, we're talking about Greater Bay Area. Um, China has been doing really well in integrating Hong Kong into this development, right? Mm -hmm. But then, if Hong Kong becomes more like Shenzhen economically, then the question is, why don't people go to Shenzhen? And uh, for a lot of people, the answer is, you know, Hong Kong's unique advantages, like, like the rule of law, you know, the courts you could still trust, and the free flow of information. But then the Consul General, uh, Greg May, that spoke with us uh, last week, bring up this point uh, in, in our interview, saying that Hong Kong is going down the slope of internet censorship. And that will, uh, I mean, in many people's mind, erode Hong Kong's advantage, right? Whether or not it is being integrated into a broader um, development plan of southern China. Well, did he cite specific examples of why he thinks where Hong Kong is headed that, down that slope? And you know, has the Hong Kong government also responded? Yeah, he, to what he said, he he said he, he made it clear that it's only a small number of websites that are being pulled, mm. uh, and then in our reporting we could tell you that um, their uh, government attempt to censor like this protest song called "Glory to Hong Kong," and uh, also this web website by some activists overseas has also been blocked. Uh, it's still the censorship is still very limited, and we still enjoy free internet more uh, uh, in in our daily life. Uh, and then Hong Kong government will, will heavily uh, review any uh, calls, uh, any statements that Hong Kong's uh, internet isn't uh, free and that its attempt to take down websites isn't legitimate. Uh, but uh, there, you know, Greg May brought up this concern, and I think this is something that uh, lots of U.S. businesses here also share. And they certainly don't want to hear anything when it comes to more regulation and the like. I mean, there's Article 23 legislation. That, that mm -hmm. consultation period ended last week. What, what's, what's next in this whole process now? Um, the government has made it very clear that they're going to move this forward because they said that an overwhelming majority of people support the bill. Mm -hmm. And um, they will quickly table this to the Legislative Council. And uh, we know that the uh, LegCo has been, uh, uh, you know, has, has basically no political opposition now and we're not f foreseeing any uh, resistance to the bill. So expect that uh, bill to get passed pretty soon. Uh, they're saying that this year. 
All right, Alan. Thank you, Alan Wong there, our China economy government editor. Also, thanks to Shuli Ren, our Bloomberg opinion columnist as well. You can get an insider's guide to the money and people shaking up Hong Kong in our new Hong Kong edition newsletter that's out every Thursday. You can sign up through the website there via Bloomberg.com slash newsletters. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. All right, it's a big week of earnings coming up out of Asia as well. We got JD.com, the likes of Neil, Billy Billy among those set to report. Joining us now with a preview is our very own Catherine Lim, Bloomberg Intelligence senior analyst. She joins us here back in Hong Kong. It's good to see you. Let's start with JD. I mean, we saw the heads on rivalry between JD and Alibaba really play out over the last 12 months or so. How do you think it's going to impact the results? Well, you know what? That's going to still take a hit on their retail margins. But I don't think it's going to be as bad as it is really because they're now doing a prolonged uh, competition with um, Alibaba. And I think, you know, just last week alone, you know, they've gone heads on on cloud too. So it's not just retail. We're going to see how that actually hits the margins and profitability of JD.com in 2024. And hence the guidance from the company on Wednesday. Okay, uh, I think Thursday, Prada reports earnings. Yep. Apart from obvious things that might be of interest, mm -hmm. why should that be particularly important? Do you know what the luxury goods company really, the bright sport, continues to be Asia? And I think that's going to be the case in 2024 as well. Now, Prada has a very good and decent-sized um, business coming from Japan. And, mm. you know, that's actually going to do and continue to be a standout um, based on what we're expecting on Thursday for 2023. And I think, you know, given the trajectory that we've seen for the rest of Asia as well, I think that's going to continue to be a bright spot for the company. So let's see. And, and what, what's going to, going to be the read-through then from these two results about what this means about the whole consumption play now in China? Right. So, Yvonne, you know, we just stepped out of Lunar New Year. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the current indication that we've gotten from some of the companies um, that has reported, I think things has normally, has not well, naturally slowed in the um, post-Lunar New Year holidays. Um, you know, nothing much has changed from six months ago. Um, mm -hmm. There's still cautious spending exhibited by you know some of the consumers out there so i think we're going to actually hear that cautious undertone coming from these um, consumption related companies and i think you know all eyes are really on to see whether there are any policies coming through from the two sessions any guidance yeah. you know from the government and you know i know it's been long overdue but hopefully we get something new this year yeah. <laughs> that's why that, that's why patience exists, right? Catherine, thank you so much. Catherine Lim there, senior APAC consumer analyst there. Uh, brief look at markets right now, some movers to tell you about. So we're starting things off with some property names specifically because some have been included uh, in the southbound stock connect. So that's the program that connects mainland exchanges to Hong Kong. And if you're included, of course, that makes you at least a stock eligible uh, to be bought and sold, of course, and as you can see, substantial gains there. Looking at some of these EV plays on the back of some uh, data coming through, sales data for February coming through and declines across the board at 10.5% for Lee Auto, perhaps more on that later. Maybe it might be down to pricing some of its models, but nothing confirmed at the moment. There we go. Yeah, we're watching also not just the EV space, uh, consumption space, the mm. healthcare space, right? We'll have chips first that we're talking about. So obviously mm. Dell, those earnings came out last week. There was a big lift given this whole AI boost. So that certainly was lifting uh, some of these chip makers in Korea as well as in Taiwan here today. And then we're checking China healthcare. A lot. Look at that. That gauge is up about 2% here right now. Three words we, we kind of caught from that Politburo meeting, which could be quite telling last week. Hmm. New productive forces. This is a term that they're talking about when it comes to stimulating new economy sectors. So tech, green energy, biotech, very much part of that. So that's why we're seeing a lot of anticipation of these stocks here. Particularly. Yeah, there's a very good write-up on the Bloomberg. If you guys want to read more about that, these new productive forces, that's out on the Bloomberg and also on the website. Well, that's it from us, our premiere of the China show. More ahead. This is Bloomberg. Thank you for joining us.